So moving on to this topic called software pipelining. Now, the assumption is that each of these uh, functions, A, B, C, capital A, B, C, D, E, F, right, are some functions that need to execute on some hardware, right? So yeah, I basically have like one piece of hardware, one hardware processor, let's say, but A to F are pipelined functions. What does a pipeline function mean? It basically means that A, for example, has a latency of three clock cycles, but an initiation interval. So what I would have in this case would essentially be something like A0, A1, A2, B0, B1, B2, C0, C1, C2. Now here's the catch. What can I do next, right? I could start putting like other instances of A and so on, but that will like really complicate my code. Okay. So instead what I'm actually going to end up doing is just wait until C0 finally produces it out its output, at which point I'll start D0. Right. And then I'll go to D1, D2. Then the rest of it continues as before. And once again, I can start from here, which is A3 at this point. Right. Which basically means that in 27 cycles, I have three instances of the loop. And if you think about what I just did, this is unrolled by a factor of three. Okay. So average time, average latency over here is equal to 27 cycles divided by three is equal to nine. Keeping in mind the context of what we have done earlier, the first thing that I would ask is, given this code over here, right? What is the iteration period bound? It's actually zero, right? So the iteration period bound, I mean, please keep that in mind. The iteration period bound is, I'm assuming that if I have infinite hardware, unlimited resources, how would I go about scheduling this? Okay, 27 is the latency. 27 is the latency on a single, uh, processor system, right? And what I actually have over here is that if I run it on a single processor system without unrolling, right? I will actually take 27 cycles to finish one iteration of this loop. And then, you know, it will repeat every 27 cycles, right? But that's not the lower bound. Iteration period bound is the lower bound that we are talking about. And as a general rule of thumb, right? If I do not have a feedback loop, that is to say, there is nothing actually which says that, you know, does a this F that is computed, is it used somewhere up there? No. Okay. So F is computed and that's it. I mean, I'm presumably, you know, writing somewhere, something, you know, something somewhere into memory, but that F value that is being computed at the end of this loop is never being used for the next iteration of A, right? A depends only on I, which is coming in from outside. Okay, so if you really look at this data flow graph corresponding to this, it is an acyclic graph. And this dependency that I have over here, this for loop, which makes it look as though I need to go till the end and then come back, is not a true dependency in the data flow itself. It is just something which is imposed by the language, by the way that I wrote the code. Okay, there is no data dependency, in other words. This is an example of what I could call a control dependency and there is no data dependency from F to A, or in fact, from any of the other things back to A. Okay. So this, in other words, is an acyclic graph, which means it's iteration period bound given infinite hardware. I would just basically schedule all the, you know, A of uh, uh, I equal to zero, I equal to one, I equal to two, all of them, all, all the way up to I equal to N minus one. I would just schedule them at one shot if I had enough hardware and do all the computations, you know, uh, instantaneously. Is the assumption that A, B up to F has zero computational delays? No. I mean, I've told you that they have latencies of three clock cycles and so on, right? But what I'm, so uh, when I say that the iteration period bound is equal to zero, that is as N tends to infinity, what is the average time per iteration? If I had something like uh, A to B, right? This has some execution time, DA, this has some time DB, but 
the iteration period bound is equal to zero because I can essentially do a0 followed by b0, a1 followed by b1, etc. a n followed by b n, right? All of them will finish in dA plus dB time. So the average iteration period becomes dA plus dB by n, which tends to zero as n tends to infinity. Okay, that is what I mean over here, right? It's exactly the same thing that I'm trying to, uh, the, the same situation that I have over here as well. Okay, so the fact that a, B, C, etc. are taking a certain amount of time to execute does not matter. That just means that there will always be some latency before the outputs come. But iteration period bound, remember, is a it's a theoretical concept, right? It's an abstract concept. It is not that you know uh, you can ask this thing. Oh, for n equal to, I mean, in other words, for this thing, if I say n is equal to hundred, and then ask what is iteration period bound for n equal to hundred, that's a meaningless question. Iteration period bound is for the data flow graph. It's a property of the graph. It is not a property of how many times it runs. If you know that the system is only going to run 100 times, then it is not a data flow graph in the sense that it is something which is, you know, uh, executing on infinite streams of input. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. If you know ahead of time that your system is only going to run 100 times and stop, then it is meaningless to ask questions like what is the iteration period bound? Okay, because all that matters then is okay, how long does it take to run 100 iterations of this? That's all you can ask. Okay, so in general, the concept of iteration period bound applies in for systems that are repetitive execution that are going to keep on running infinite amount of time. Okay, so all right, so what we have seen now is that I managed to essentially, you know. Uh, unroll this loop and I have got a decent amount of benefit, right? The average latency came down from uh, 27 to 3, uh, sorry, sorry, to 9, right? By a factor of 3. Okay. The problem is that's obviously still not good enough because I have this big hole over here, right? What do I do with this? Okay. So the question that then comes is can I rewrite my code in a slightly different or rather you know rewrite my functionality in a slightly different way what if i do this right i do a b c d e f a b c d e f right i'm just i'm just putting this pattern down over here and i want to see whether it is sort of meaningful whether i can even get this to work the question that I'm basically going to uh, ask over here is, you know, obviously if I have, this is, let's say, if I do A0, B0, this is wrong, right? Why am I saying it's wrong? Because I need to at least do A0, leave two blanks before I can get to B0. That is A0 has to complete before I can get to B0, okay? But what if instead I had a1 over here and b0 okay what does that actually mean it means that the same pattern right a0 something f over here b c d e f would be here which basically means a0 would be here and b0 would be here and the latency a0 to b0 is greater than or equal to three cycles Right? So in other words, this condition is now satisfied. Right? So as long as this, the first instance of A is A1 and not A0, right? or, or it could be A2 or it could be A3, what it means is that the actual A0, the value that B0 depends on, would have been completed before I get to the point where I'm trying to execute this B. Okay. And this is the crucial thing. This is pretty much all that you need to keep in mind, right? In general, as long as I have some A of I plus one over here and B I over here, right? That's pretty much all that I need to worry about, okay? 
because then what I would have is that this would be AI and the dependency that I get is from here to here. What is the drawback of A0, A1 up to A11, B0, B1? What was the drawback of unrolling in the first place? Right? What would my code have looked like? Unrolled code would look like the for loop would essentially have A0, A1, A2, B0, B1, B2, right? I would actually have to write out code for this sort. So in other words, code size increased by 3x. Okay. If you want to do 12 times, code size will go up by a factor of 12x. That's it. In fact, that is precisely, that is the only drawback that you really have over here. It's not the only drawback. I mean, it's a fairly uh, big drawback because you know this might be a lot of code that you are talking about. But uh, in principle, that's it. Okay. Now, on the other hand, what we are seeing over here is, let me take you know some. The problem that I came up with over here, right, was essentially the fact that between C zero to D zero, I had a big gap. Right. I needed like twelve cycles to be over there. Right. So let me just take some arbitrary value of D. I will call this D I, right? And I want to see where should C have been such that, you know, I can guarantee that by the time I reach D I, C I has completed, okay? Which basically means I need to move back 12 cycles from here. This is 12 cycles, which means that if this was equal to C I, so this is okay, right? In other words, this thing is taken care of as long as I have this dependency over here, right? So what does that mean? Now let me work backwards from here, right? Which basically means that now this is going to be CI plus one. This is going to be CI plus two. And if I wanted this CI plus two to have the dependency satisfied, this only needs to be BI plus three. Now, if you look at this, right? What this is telling me is, now let me write down just one part of it, right? The A, B, C, D, E, F. What this is saying is, as long as this was some di, this was i plus 2, this was i plus 3, this was i plus 4, and further going in the other direction, I get this is i minus 1 and i minus 2, right? Or in other words, another way of doing it would be, I let's just take this as f0, this would be e1, d2, c4 d5 and a6 right these are the ones that basically need to execute in one iteration okay what does that mean it means that my code essentially now looks something like this i would have a for loop which basically says a of i minus 6 b of i minus 5, c of i minus 4, d of i minus 2, e of i minus 1, and f of i are the values that are going to execute, right? For what value of i can I do this? If I write i equal to 0 over here, that's going to cause problems. Right, because then I will basically, I mean, let me look at this code, right? I essentially started out with this code, i equal to zero up to m. Okay. Obviously, if I write for i equal to zero up to n, that's going to be a problem because then I will be starting with a of minus six and so on. Okay. But on the other hand, if I start from i equal to six and say i less than n, i plus plus, then this is fine. I'm not going to have any problems. Right. So this basically becomes my loop body. What is missing over here? I need to compute a of zero, a of one, a of two, a of three, a of four, and a of five. Right. From a of six onwards, that will be computed inside the loop. What do I need to do for b? I need to do b zero. And for C, I need to do C0, C1, C2, C3. For D, I only need to do D0, D1. And for E, I need to do E0. 
okay all of these things are code that i will have to write outside the loop body i will actually have to do that explicitly okay and this is in general called the prolog what does prolog mean it basically means something that has to be done before i get into the actual computation the actual loop structure this is minus 1 minus 2 minus 4 minus 5 and minus 6 right so in other words this pattern that i have over here this is i i minus 1 i minus 2 uh i minus 4 i minus 5 and i minus 6 okay so if i look at this now what will happen is uh, a is running from this part of it uh, the prolog computes a0 to a5 the loop body computes a6 to a n minus 1 once again the loop body over here computes b5 to b n minus 2 okay so where does b n minus 1 get computed it has to be done outside the loop okay c4 to c n minus 3 gets computed inside the loop which means c n minus 2 and c n minus 1 need to get to get done outside okay and similarly if i go through this what i will finally have is that f n minus uh, 5 f n minus 4 up to f n minus 1 five values over here all of them need to get computed outside the loop all of this part is called the epilog i have now reordered the way in which i do the computations such that one iteration that i have over here basically has one instance each of a b c d e f right and all that i need to make sure of is that they are the correct number of the correct instance number of each of those a b c d e f so that there are no dependency violations okay how do i come up with what should be the correct value the simplest way would actually be to work through this right the example that i showed above over there i find out the dependencies between the c and uh, the a to b b to c c to d d to e e to f and i make sure that i have enough gap between them so that the entire thing gets properly software pipeline okay why am i calling it a software pipeline right let's think about what is actually happening to the uh, graph over here right the data flow graph corresponding to this was essentially a output is being used by b this by c then d e and f okay now what has happened finally after i did the pipelining i essentially ended up with i i minus 1 i minus 2 i minus 4 i minus 5 i minus 6 okay what does that correspond to it basically says that the graph looks like this one delay one delay two delays one delay one delay okay so that is why we are calling this a software pipelining it is basically essentially the way to think about it is i essentially put one delay element one register out here one over here two in this case one over here one over here right this is regular pipelining right it software pipelining and in fact it can only be done in the case of feed forward graphs like this where you can actually go in and put these delay elements right how did i decide that i needed two elements out here that was dependent on how much latency c actually had right so this was determined by the fact that c required so many uh, cycles i mean so that its value could be ready for d okay and essentially all that we are saying is we are providing enough storage such that the past two samples of c can be stored somewhere and used by d later 